just mentioned, I'll be talking about our floating treatment pods for lake communities. Uh, this work was carried out by Wiley Jennings, an intern at Wetlands Work. And uh, Uche Kwon is our staff researcher, and Tabor Han is the founder and director of Wetlands Work. And we're based in Southern Cambodia. Uh, so Cambodia, just a brief overview, is um, sandwiched there between Vietnam and Thailand. You can see Tome Sap Lake takes up a big part of Cambodia. Uh, the lake takes up an even bigger part of Cambodia during the rainy season. The area of the lake grows from about 2,700 uh, kilometers squared up to 16,000 kilometers squared. Uh, then the depth of the lake in the dry season is about one meter, so quite a shallow body of water in the rainy season, not just because of the rain, but also all the water coming from up north from China and Laos. Uh, the depth goes up to almost 10 meters and more in certain areas. Sanitation in Cambodia is not, um, well, not very sophisticated at this point. This is the open sewer of uh, Phnom Penh, the capital. Um, most households discharge untreated sewage into this canal and it gets uh, desludged with a um, with a claw now and again. There's actually, I don't know if you can see, but there's actually somebody walking inside the sewer canal helping with the dislodging. Uh, there is no municipal wastewater treatment plant. This is all we have for now. Overall in the country, less than 20% of households have a toilet. Um, in part, this is due to the difficult terrain, um, due to high groundwater and seasonal flooding. Cambodia, most of the settlements are located in the floodplains, the, the very fertile areas of the country, which flood regularly, which makes um, the installation of ordinary pit toilets quite difficult. So if that wasn't challenging enough, there are also floating villages. These are actual uh, entire settlements that float. Um, there are over 100,000 people uh, living in floating homes, and these have no sanitation at all. People simply defecate into the water surrounding their homes. Uh, sometimes they'll have a hole in the floor within their home, which they use as their toilet. Um, th these are the 100,000 homes on the lake, on Tomisa. Uh, these homes actually migrate with the lake, so when the uh, shoreline recedes during the dry season, the homes move towards the center of the lake when in the rainy season they kind of follow the shoreline to the outskirts. So you see some vegetation there, but it is all partially submerged vegetation. Uh, these villages are quite difficult to access. We're working um, in some villages that are quite close to Phnom Penh, only about 130 kilometers away, but it takes us a good six, seven hours to reach them. This is what a floating village looks like from space. Uh, this is actually a floating town. I mean, there's cell phone shops, hardware shops, but these are all floating um, houses. You can see that, that those are all the white specks. The, the yellow road, that's the actual you know, earth road end, and then you have to hop in a boat to continue on into the lake. So a very interesting environment. This is an actual village. Uh, it might be one of the villages we're working on. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, you can see the houses are kind of arranged along a little tributary flowing into the lake or out of the lake, depending. So these floating houses tend to be quite small. The, um, the water around the houses is used as the playground by the children. There really isn't much space to have your recreation anywhere else. So children spend hours of their day in the water from a very young age. Um, you see children, you know, three, four years old swimming around in the water. And what is the ambient water quality considering all of this? Well, these are uh, the results of some analysis that we did. This is mainly uh, starting in the dry season, getting into the rainy season. The red squares, this is um, outside of the settlements. So you can see the E. coli counts are under 1,000. Um, in, in the settlements, so Akol is the, one of the villages we work in, Kampong Luang is a, 
uh, larger town, there the counts are much higher, so getting up to um, 10 to the 5. Uh, as a comparison, the Rec 1 limits or recreation, contact recreation, as defined by the US EPA, is about 200 coliform forming units per 100 mils. Uh, Rec 2, that's non contact recreation, is about 2,000. So we're dealing um, with quite contaminated water. So the objective of our work is to improve the ambient water quality as measured by E. coli numbers and the incidence of diarrheal diseases among, the, uh, among children between zero and five years old. And the system that we're working on, it's called a pod. So it's, a, it's made out of widely used tarpaulin. It's, uh, it, we have one and a half liter empty water bottles sewn into the edge that keep it afloat. A single pod is about 235 liters and the dimensions are about a meter by one and a half meters, depth about 30 to 40 centimeters. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's installed. This is actually um, a double pod, the to so the total volume here is 470 liters approximately. One of the pods is under the house and receives the waste. It's attached to the house by ropes. Um, and the plant you see inside the pod, this is the water hyacinth. Um, it's very well documented um, for its remediation abilities. It's used to uh, remove nitrogenous phosphorus from various um, effluents. It has high met of heavy metal removal abilities as well. It's originally from South America, but now it's, uh, it's spread throughout the tropics. It's, it's, quite, it's considered to be quite invasive. Um, it grows very quickly in, in, uh, in our pods as well with a, a kind of a in-use pod. It can, the mass can increase more than five-fold in three weeks. It's very resilient, so even though it really loves the nutrient-rich water, it can also survive for prolonged periods of time in, you know, in just tap water with very little nutrients. Um, as you can see, there is a lot of root here, so there is very high um, surface area for microbial activity, which I think plays um, a very important role in its uh, remediation abilities. So we've tested these pods in several ways. Uh, we filled the pods with water and add hyacinth. Uh, these tests I'm going to talk about now they uh, were done on land, so the, po the pods were not floating. They were placed within a wooden frame, so there's no exchange with the environment. And we measured, we inoculated the pods with either sewage or raw feces and measured E. coli numbers over time. So sewer water, readily available in Phnom Penh. Um, here is the results of a experiment. We added 35 liters of sewage every day. That's about 13% of the total volume. The initial levels of E. coli in the sewage water are range between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. Over a period of about three days, with continual adding of the um, daily adding, daily addition of the sewage, uh, th these went down to about uh, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 2. Um, the, the green line shows a pod with hyacinth, and the blue line shows a pod without hyacinth. So actually, it was more the sequestration than the hyacinth that was doing the work. However, um, this changed when we added raw uh, feces to the pods. Uh, in this case, this was just a one-time inoculation. So we added 500 grams of feces to a pod, the green line again with the hyacinth, it performed much better than the, um, than the pod without the hyacinth in this case. There was also a big difference in the smell and the appearance of the water at the end of the experiment. The pod with the hyacinth, the water actually cleared up. We had um, clear water at the end of uh, the, the very end of the experiment, 13 days later. On the other hand, the pod without the hyacinth was, uh, was filled with algae and there was still a lot of um, particular matter um, and floating turf. So then we have also tested the pod on the lake. It's um, attached to a house. In this case, uh, it's a double pod, so just like the one you saw earlier, two pods connected with one being underneath the house and there's flow from the pod under the house into the pod. 
um, next uh, outside the house. So the um, in the input pod uh, over the past few months, the average has been about sixty-five thousand uh, CFU per hundred mil uh, with the output pod. Um, so the one outside the house, it's about ten thousand CFU per hundred mils. Um, this is quite a significant reduction. Um, this is obviously a, you know, an overestimate, but the total E. coli that we're expecting in a pod like this with a four person household would be about 10 to the 8 CFU. So this is, a, this is quite an improvement. Um, yeah, I should add that in, in this case, uh, unlike in the graphic that we just saw, the uh, pod under the house didn't have hyacinth, it was simply covered, and I'll get back to that in a second. So we're also very interested in how users find these pods. This is, um, this is how the owner of this house actually uses it. They have these two planks and you take the lid off the white plastic bucket that you see there and you squat down and do your thing, put the lid back on. Um, so it's being tested with the, also on a floating research station as well as the, um, the household. Some of the challenges that we've had with this is actually receiving accurate feedback from the from the users because they tend to want to tell us what we want to hear. So if we ask, there wasn't any smell, was there? They say, no, 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 there was no smell. So why don't you use it because it smells? So it's a bit it's a bit um, complicated, but we've, uh, we've gotten around that issue some somehow somewhat. Uh, and the reason why we decided to cover up that first pod that's placed under the house is uh, to address the smell issue. And once we did that, it seems to be quite okay. We've also installed this um, bucket to address that. What we didn't um, anticipate was the mice. Um, the mice, apparently, when they're, they're floating mice in floating houses, they, they went and harvested all the leaves off of our hyacinth plant to pad their nests, apparently. They also were reported to have stolen some clothing from the house of the occupants. Um, fortunately, hyacinth is very readily available in these areas, so um, what, what we did was just add more hyacinth to this pod. So this is kind of how our design has evolved. The key features we're going for is affordability and the current model, which includes a wooden extension, uh, a bit more elaborate than what you just saw. It's about $20. Uh, we want it to be mainly local materials, which we've also accomplished with this tarp model. The tarp is widely used for all sorts of um, waterproofing activities and uh, can also be produced locally. There's nothing um, technical about this. It's low maintenance and um, the kind of the nicer looking wooden platform has turned out to be quite popular with the villagers. People have come up to the current user and have asked about getting one as well. So, uh, so yeah. So we placed the bucket. Uh, that was one of the steps that was key to kind of um, encouraging usage of the toilet. I think the fact that people are also more removed from their uh, excreta is definitely helping. Uh, covering the first pod to address the smell issue. We're also offering the users an option of whether to install the pods externally to their house or indoors. Some people seem to prefer just to kind of have that hole in their floor um, you know, on the edge of the house and then just slide the pod under that, whereas others want to build an additional platform to kind of extend away from their house. Um, so one of the issues with the tarp though is that it degrades under UV light um, this only happens with the pods that we've used as controls, so without the hyacinth. The hyacinth actually provides enough shade to, um, to prevent this UV damage, but this is a pod that we use as a control for an experiment, and uh, you can see some tears along the sides, and you know, we, we lost a couple of bottles there. Um, so we're, we're now trying out bamboo pods lined with some sort of waterproof material, uh, these had stability issues, so we're trying out uh, new designs where the pod has flexible sections that are connected with uh, something like inner tube tires. It would be great to find something biodegradable, but we haven't come up with anything yet. It's also possible just to you know, protect the edge of the tarp with something like paint. Um, 
those are some of the things we're looking into at the moment. Uh, this is one of our surveyors. Um, she is deftly anchoring the boat with her foot to the house as she asks questions. Um, this is part of our work uh, at the moment to have the pods adopted on the village scale. We're doing a study where we have one village act as the control, so they're uh, we're just doing kind of baseline surveying there, and one village will have the pods. They're, the villages are very similar; they're about an hour by oops, about an hour by boat apart. Uh, about 40 households in one, 50 in the other, similar income levels. Again, we're targeting zero to five year olds. Um, it's a very simple questionnaire that's done on a weekly basis about gastrointestinal systems and whether the children have been in contact with water. Um, another part of our project is to implement a similar uh, project, well, similar uh, product in Lake Elaine, Burma. Um, this is a picture from our trip to Burma, to the lake. This was done um, in March, May 2012. Well, we connected with a group called the Buddhist Youth for uh, Inlay Watershed who are very interested in dealing with uh, various water and sanitation issues. It's very similar in the sense to the, the Cambodian setting where the water level changes seasonally and uh, at the moment there is no solution to the household sewage issue, it's discharged and treated into the lake. On the other hand, the houses here don't actually flow, they're stilted houses, um, and there are about 70,000 inhabitants. Also, there seems to be quite a different attitude to sanitation, um, there seems to be more of an interest in finding a solution. Um, other future work, we would like to evaluate the effectiveness of the pods beyond indicator organisms and analyze the user feedback and response to the user feedback, do some tracer experiments to um, figure out a little bit more about how our pods are working. Um, this is a floating pig farm. There is a, a lot of work being done at the moment to improve the income levels of the floating villagers. Um, one of the projects is to promote uh, floating pig farms. So these are obviously creating a lot of waste as well, so it would be uh, very interesting to adapt our pods to deal with pig waste, which is currently just like human waste being discharged straight into the, uh, into the lake. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their support um, and also to thank Conservation International. Thank you very much.